All glory, laud, and honor to the Redeemer King. In the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome to First Presbyterian Church in New Bern, North Carolina. Welcome to worship for this Palm Passion Sunday, April 10th, 2022. It is good that we are together. Let us worship God. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. This is the day that the Lord has made. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let us rejoice and be glad. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let us worship God. We come with shouts of Hosanna, but then things change in the week ahead. With all that is ahead in mind, let us come before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. Triumphant God, we join the crowds of the ages in shouting your praises. While our lips give you glory, our lives seldom reflect your purposes. We sing easily of your greatness, but living faithfully, is often beyond us. We hear of your salvation, yet sin is still close and real, daily leading us away from you. Have mercy on us. Ride into our hearts with healing grace. Forgive what we have done and direct who we shall be. Lord, save us. Lord, help us. Hosanna. When we come before God with our confession, We are greeted with the help we seek. We are greeted with forgiveness. We are greeted with grace so that we may move forward in the week ahead with our Lord. Let us begin our response to this grace by proclaiming the summary of the law. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself.
us pray. Almighty God, on this day, on this day, as we remember, as we lift up, as we honor your marching into Jerusalem to save us, we know that that was only the beginning of your week. As we turn now to what happened after, guide us. Through the wisdom of your spirit, guide us that we might see what you are calling us to see, know what you are calling us to know, and feel what you are calling us to feel, that we may respond to your gospel call of grace with gladsome hearts and minds. Amen. Before today's scripture reading, I wanted to offer a word of explanation about why this is the scripture for today. You might have noticed, you might even already be familiar, that today is Palm Passion Sunday. It's not just Palm Sunday. Why is that? Well, it's a relatively recent addition to our liturgical calendar. It recognizes that most of us are not in church every day of Holy Week. And yet there's a lot that happens in this week. We go from Hosanna to Jesus entering Jerusalem, to the temple, to the supper, to the betrayal, to the garden, to the arrest. So much is happening before then crucifixion, tomb. And so without hearing those stories, it was not the best worshipful action to go straight from the Hosanna to the Alleluia of Easter morning. And so to give people the opportunity to hear some of these stories, to be present with where Jesus goes in between the Hosanna and the Alleluia, we now incorporate some of the Passion Text into our Sunday worship on Palm Sunday, hence why we call it Palm Passion Sunday. There will be some worship opportunities here at First Presbyterian this week. On Thursday, Monday Thursday, the night we remember that Jesus gathered with his disciples, we will gather with the congregation at 11 o'clock a.m. in the sanctuary. So 11 in the morning in the sanctuary, we will have a service that will include the celebration of communion. Then that service will be videoed and that video will go up on our YouTube channel and link to our website sometime that evening. It will most certainly be there by seven o'clock, but we will send an email out when it is posted. On Sunday morning, we have a whole lineup of joyful gatherings. We'll be indoors in the sanctuary at 8.30, and weather permitting, we'll be outdoors at 11. There'll be time of fellowship in the courtyard that starts at 9.45, and all of our children and youth will be helping with an Easter egg hunt that will be at 10.30. Now we know that bad weather can come our way. The Easter egg hunt will move indoors. If we have to move worship indoors, we will decide that by 5 p.m. on Saturday and we'll email the congregation and post it on our website. But the rain location for our 11 o'clock worship service is in the sanctuary. 
but if we can be outdoors as we hope, we invite you to bring a chair, a blanket, um, and come and gather for worship as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. But now, on this Palm Passion Sunday, let us hear these words from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus went them, went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but you want. Then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not stay awake with me even one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. Again he came, and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before he became a Baptist preacher, Gordon Atkinson was a seminary student. And as a student, he took a class on chaplaincy and became a chaplain intern in a local hospital. He was on call one night when he got a call to come to the ICU to sit with a patient's wife. The patient had just arrived and the doctors told this young, inexperienced chaplain that it would not be much longer. He would not survive the health crisis that had arrived for him that evening. So Gordon went and introduced himself to the patient's wife and it turns out it was someone that he'd met before. It was a famous evangelist's wife, an evangelist who went by the name of a cowboy evangelist, Billy Davis. So. Gordon introduced himself again to his wife, who promptly said to him, Get on your knees, chaplain. We got to get to praying. So Mrs. Davis, knowing that her husband was in the ICU, took her Bible with both hands, held it up at the air, Gordon says, and began what he thought at the time was the strangest prayer he had ever heard. He knew that she had heard from the doctors the same news that he had, and yet in her prayer, she cried out to the Lord in her grief. She said that demons were dragging her husband down to hell, and she begged and pleaded for God to save his life. She reminded, that Billy, she reminded God that Billy was his servant, that he had saved countless souls, and she asked God to save this little cowboy preacher who loved him so. Save my little Billy, your servant, your own little cowboy preacher. Save him from the vicious hounds of hell that would drag him down to perdition. Gordon Atkinson reports she was putting everything she had into this prayer, and it was a prayer like none I had ever heard in any of the Baptist churches where I had grown up. And as I heard her pray and as I heard her beg for her husband's life, I was bothered by the theology of her prayer. A central teaching of Christianity, after all, is that death is no longer something to fear, that we can approach death faithfully, that death is not the enemy. And it seemed to me, he said, that Mrs. Davis was forgetting that part of her faith. And so when Mrs. Davis stopped praying, she turned to the chaplain and asked him to pray. And Gordon says, as he tells the story, God love me, I was so young and so ignorant. So after Mrs. Davis was finished praying, when she invited me to pray, I began my prayer. And it was a much quieter, much calmer prayer. 
and I carefully countered each of her theological points with words that I addressed to God. And I said, there is no reason to be afraid for Billy, God, for we know that he is in your hands. He is in the hands of his maker. Of course, we know, dear Lord, that death is no longer the enemy and that it is not our will, but yours be done. So after my prayer, so young and naive that I was, I fully expected to open my eyes and see Mrs. Davis there with her eyes opened and grateful that I had taught her so many things about faith. But instead I found her staring at me with her mouth wide open. What? He's dead? Did they not tell me? And I said, no, no, he's still alive as far as we know. We will have to wait for the doctor to come and give us news about that. But Mrs. Davis seemed confused. She said, but you were praying like he was already dead. Gordon Atkinson says he had no response for that. He just looked back at her. She could not comprehend his prayer, so she began praying again. She began pleading again for God to save her husband from the hounds of hell, and she kept on praying. She no longer took any breaks for this inexperienced chaplain to pray. She kept on with her fears howling and calling to God for assistance until that very moment when the doctors came in and told her that Billy had died. Gordon says that at that point he braced himself for the worst. If this woman had been so distressed, so agitated, so fully, fully absorbed by what was happening, so upset, if that had been her reaction to him being in the ICU, he thought that certainly it would get even worse now that he was dead. Instead, what happened was that Ms. Davis quietly got down on her knees, raised her eyes to heaven and said, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We are going to miss my Billy dearly, but we know he has gone on to his reward. She made a sudden 180 degree turnaround. Suddenly his death was a reward and a victory. Gordon says he puzzled over this for weeks. He couldn't understand how she could pray one thing one moment and as something entirely different the next. He said it took him years to figure it out. He said, sometimes people don't mean what they say. They mean what they mean. Prayer is not simply a communication of words. It is a full-bodied expression of their soul. People weave their history, their theology, their brokenness, their buzzwords, their ignorance, and what wisdom they have into a very private and intimate conversation with God. And that's what Mrs. Davis had done. She'd been completely honest with God when Billy was still alive, and when he was dead, she was completely honest once again but it was different. They were both true. In the last few weeks, friends, we've gained and claimed some time to talk about prayer here in worship, some Lenten time to focus on prayer. We've talked about prayer in a general sense and how Jesus asked us to pray. We've talked about prayer as confession and prayer as thanks. We've talked about prayer as lament and prayer as silence. And today, as we conclude our series on prayer, we're talking about the importance of being boldly honest in our prayers. Boldly honest. That is what God asks of us, to be completely honest in our prayers. Maybe you have already mastered this. Maybe this is something you already understand. But I know that I talk to people every week who still trip over how they should be praying. They struggle with how to pray to God exactly what is in their hearts and instead worry about what they think they are supposed to be praying or what they should be praying. I began learning this lesson, a lesson I'm sure I'll never completely learn, but I began to learn about how important it is to be honest in my prayers when I had graduated from seminary and was looking for my first job as a minister, a family friend asked me how things were going. And I said, oh, they're going okay. I'm really ready to get started, ready to receive a call to a church, but that's okay. I know it will work out in God's time. So I just tell God that I'll be patient until it comes along, until the right church emerges. And she looked at me with a puzzled expression and she said, why? Why aren't you telling God exactly what you want? 
Why don't you tell God that you're ready for a church, that you want to serve? Why are you hedging what's in your heart? God can handle the details, you know. And she was right. She was so very, very right. Why did I feel like I needed to protect God with my prayers? Why I needed to be less than honest in what I told God about what was in my heart? Why did I think that God could work better with what I thought was supposed to be in my heart rather than what was actually in my heart? I've replayed this script many times. I think about it in another way, like when I pray for snow. I love snow and I've prayed for snow, but so many times I pray for snow and then I begin to feel guilty because I know that people who are experiencing houselessness or people who have to go to work, that snow would struggle, be a struggle for them. And I worry and I think, well, maybe I shouldn't be praying for snow. And then I catch myself and I think, well, Anna, just because you prayed for snow, doesn't mean that you now control the weather. God can handle it. Why do I think I need to hedge my prayers? God can take our prayers. And maybe when I pray for snow, it's a way for God to then take that desire and show me that what I really want isn't snow. What I want is a day with a different change of pace, a day that has a different routine. God can take our honest prayers and use them to transform us. But only if we give God what's really in our hearts. Or in a much more serious kind of prayer, and not a prayer for snow, but in a much more serious kind of prayer, you've heard me talk about my friends the Tuttles before. Their son, Heath, received a heart transplant when he was about one year old. Without that transplant, he would not have lived. Did they pray for that heart transplant? Yes, they prayed fiercely. They prayed with all that they had, as did everyone around them. We prayed for that heart to be made available. And at the same time, they taught us how to pray for the family who on the day they received the best news of their lives, would be receiving the worst news of their lives. Knowing the full story of what was going to happen did not keep them from praying for that heart that Heath would receive, but it did transform how they told the story and how they taught us all how to pray, to pray honestly and completely. We are asked to pray honestly and completely what is in our hearts. We can pray for a medical healing even when the facts don't back that up. We can still pray for that miracle healing. We can pray for death to arrive for someone whose body or mind is no longer sustaining them. And we can pray for them to find peace. We can pray for radical justice knowing that it will not likely unfold tomorrow, and yet we can still pray for it, to pray for radical justice, racial justice, economic justice, jubilee like the Bible invites us to live. We can pray for peace, for people to drop their weapons and embrace their enemies. Why on earth would we ever feel the need to be realistic? and to lower our hopes in our prayers? Why would we ever feel the need to diminish what we dream for in our prayers? When did God ever ask us to settle for less than God's actual kingdom being welcomed here on earth? And if we want an example of how to pray honestly and boldly and faithfully, we need look no further than Jesus himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. What does he pray in this moment when he knows what is unfolding? He has walked right into it. And what does Jesus pray in this moment? He prays Jesus, he prays and says, God, if it's possible, this cup can go to someone else. If possible, God, let this cup pass from me. He follows that by saying, I know I want your will to be done, but if it's possible, this cup can pass. 
Do we doubt Jesus' faith? Do we think that he was selfish for praying that? Do we think that he didn't understand the needs of others? Of course not. Jesus knows that God's will will be done. But here's what Jesus teaches us in that honest prayer. We can trust God. We can trust God with our most honest prayers, just as Jesus did on that difficult night. We can trust God with our big prayers, our hopes, our wants, our needs, our worries. We don't have to varnish them. We don't have to diminish them. We don't have to hedge our prayers. God is big enough, God is strong enough, God is wise enough to handle them. We don't need to manage that. In fact, what we know is that God is not only big enough, God is bigger. God is not only strong enough, God is stronger. God is not only wise enough, God is wiser. Boldly honest is what we are called to be boldly honest, and then radically quiet to listen to what God is doing, how God is working and shifting and being present in our hearts to transform us so that we might receive the answers that are already unfolding. We can trust God and be honest about what is in our hearts, and that is what prayer is all about. Amen. As we begin our response to God's word, let us affirm what it is that we believe. And today we're using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from north and south and east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of our Lord. As we learn in the Gospels, it was when they were at table with Jesus. He took bread, blessed it, and gave it to them. It was then that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is our Lord's table, and our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share in the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, you created the heavens and the earth, sea and dry ground, creeping things and flying birds, mountains and plains, desert sands and forest canopies. All around us, the beauty of your handiwork is evident. We praise you for such wonder. In love and freedom, you gave us your blessing to eat from every plant and from the fruit of the trees. In return for your generosity and abundance, we grasped for more than you gave us, separating ourselves from you through sin. Yet even when we were unfaithful, you remained faithful to us. You continued to give us the gift of your good creation. When we were bound as slaves, you gave us freedom by opening a pathway through the sea. When we complained in the desert, you gave us water to drink and manna to eat. When we wandered from your ways, you sent prophets to call us back and give us hope. 
As Isaiah promised, we went out in joy and were led back in peace. It seemed to us that the mountains and hills burst into song, and the trees of the field clapped their hands in praise of your power and faithfulness. Then, in the fullness of time, you sent your Son to save us. Jesus preached and healed. He taught and challenged us. He loved and encouraged us. Yet our songs of praise become shouts of death. Palm branches lifted high and honor were left in the dust. When we had turned away, he offered forgiveness and eternal life. We thank you for such wondrous love as this. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon the gifts of this table. As Christ broke bread in that upper room and shared the cup with his disciples, so may this meal be our communion with Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with him and with all who are baptized in his name, so that we may offer our own Hosanna to the one who has come and is coming again. Strengthen us in the days of the Holy Week before us and for all the days to our life's end to recognize this one who comes humbly and so to follow him. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, the night he gave himself up for us, our Lord took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them to eat, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, each time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving love of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us keep the feast. I now invite you to take whatever elements you have, whatever it is you have to eat, whatever it is you have to drink, and say, this is the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have invited us. You have invited us and welcomed us and fed us at this table. Having been fed in this time of communion with you, send us forth to walk in your way, to live the life of love to which you have called us. We ask it in your name. Amen. Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Jesus, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, Friends, know that wherever you go and whatever you do, you are God's beloved child in this holy week and all weeks. So speak the good news. Deliberate the will of God. Reach out to the fearful. Comfort the lonely. Sing, hope, pray, and laugh. And may God create in us bountiful souls. May Jesus Christ walk beside us. And may the Holy Spirit add a dance to our steps. Amen.